bid you good day. On this day, in particular, I choose to offer to you some simple words already in your vocabulary. Perhaps you will say, well, here is a topic I already know very much about. No news here. But I wish to offer to you in the same simplicity that the moment calls for, perhaps a deeper meaning to words that you would already recognize, so that perhaps you will use them slightly differently or think upon them slightly differently as they are presented to you. These words offered to you in this English language you will easily be able to translate into any other native language, for every language has very similar words, and more than likely, similar meanings. But here I offer them to you perhaps within a deeper context, another way so that they will become practical, but practical to the spirit. Practical because they are words that in some ways can be used magnetically or electrically. In other words, they are polarized words. They are powerful, not simply because of their intention or even because they are known to your social graces. They are potent words because they have the power to draw to you or near you perhaps some of those things and thoughts that are near and dear to you already, perhaps some of those things that have been elusive in one way or another. Simple as they are, we will dance with them a little bit, allowing them to be our complete partner. Sometimes you will notice that I will lead. Other times you will see that Gaia follows, allowing the words themselves, their beauty their poetic nature, their practical, potent nature to lead in the dance of life. In this same way, I would offer to you that counsel, even from the beginning, that when it is important, you will lead. And other moments, you need only follow. Following the treasure that is already there, following the trail of breadcrumbs that has already set for you, following, in essence, your own nature, your own path, needing to do very little, and only there to reap the rewards. So, to begin with, it would be well to offer gratitude. Well, that is simple enough, isn't it? One believes that one is always in gratitude. But gratitude has a very unique understanding of itself. Gratitude knows that all things are already present. So gratitude comes not after the fact, but before the fact. Sometimes, as you use the word, you would find that you receive something, a gift or something hoped for, and then you are in gratitude. Or in some ways you have been taught, yes, taught, to be in gratitude all of the time, so that you will always be in a receiving nature. But this is forgotten or left by the wayside. It is difficult to feel in gratitude all of the time, particularly when one is involved in the daily stresses of life itself. However, as I have said, gratitude precedes almost everything. Gaia, the earth, is in gratitude all of the time. Is it in gratitude for poverty? No but it is in gratitude that the earth is always able to surmount poverty and that, because it is always present, precedes poverty. So the earth is in gratitude for all of the resources. 
Does this mean that they are always plentiful? No. However, to understand gratitude knows that the resources themselves are always bringing themselves forward, creating and co-creating themselves. So Gaia, the earth, is always in gratitude, preceding the moment, leading, as I have said earlier. Once you can understand how gratitude works, for there is a science of gratitude itself, you can begin to use it in a practical way. It is not exactly a tool. It is more a statement of fact. Gratitude is because you are. You are because gratitude exists in the universe. Gratitude, then, is the understanding that one is always receiving, always capable to receive, and, in fact, always capable to shift or to change one's awareness from something to some other thing, from yes to no, from visible to invisible. Gratitude allows you to always know that there will be a tomorrow. If you did not understand gratitude, tomorrow, in fact, may not come. Tomorrow does not come simply because science dictates it. It comes because there is an expectation of it. It comes because the earth is in gratitude for humanity upon it, and humanity in turn expects there to be a tomorrow, expects there to be a new idea. Are gratitude and expectation linked then? Well, in some small measure, yes. They are borrowed partners, if you like, or partners that have been pushed together and made to enjoy one another's company. Gratitude, then, is the ability to know. It is the wisdom behind receiving. Gratitude knows how to receive. Gratitude knows where the receiving will come from. Gratitude does not need to look to see where that something will manifest or from what direction it is coming. It simply is the knowingness or the science of knowing that all things are possible, that all things already exist, and that in gratitude, in essence, they travel faster. So when you are in the science of gratitude, the polarity that opposes gratitude becomes smaller. Why? Because you are leading with gratitude, polarity therefore follows. Gratitude exists in the center between the two poles, if you like, between the haves and the have-nots. Therefore, gratitude draws from both polarities, from the positive and the negative, and receives them into a state of being that knows or expects that all things are possible, that all things will therefore be. Therefore, gratitude then is a magnetic word, a powerful, practical, magnetic word. It draws into the center of all things that which already exists, has always existed, and now becomes more than possible, in fact becomes present. So gratitude brings presence. Gratitude allows desire to exist at peace. Gratitude allows desire to use the science of manifestation to make, to create. Gratitude is a creator word. Desire then makes something happen something come true or come into being, into noticeable being. Gratitude is a centered word. It allows fullness of being. It draws from the exquisite nature 
of the physical and the non-physical realms. It allows all things to be what they are, how they are, as they are, and at the same time it exerts not energy in this case, but quality. Gratitude has the quality, then, of all those things that are drawn into the center of your awareness or the center of your being. Gratitude creates life, invites life, breathes life into desire, so that desire can then look into the nothingness can look into the face of the void, into the face of the nothingness, and still put its hand out, ready to receive. Because it is grateful. Grateful that is what is desired, is already present, is already being received. Gratitude always exists in the present. Again, it is a word that both leads and follows. It is a word of science. It is a word of praise and prose. And where you can apply this to many of your ideas and projects, you will see that it is very useful. It is one of the natural words, meaning that it is native to all beings in all worlds. It is natural to this universe. It is natural to the earth. It is natural to all things that are made real or made manifest. It is natural to all those things that exist. The next word that we can examine with a slight different meaning is prayer. Well, prayer has been ascribed to several different religions each one claiming in some way to have invented it, or each one claiming in some way to have a direct access route to God or the Creator, the Creator beings, or those who offer life itself. Prayer, then, is a form of communication, so it is a language. We may call it its own language a language that also then is common to certain religions. It is also common to beliefs and to thought. And at the same time, it is a potent word. It has a certain charge to it. There are those that believe in prayer and those that do not. Those that readily acknowledge it and those that in their own way would reject it altogether. Well, Prayer is no more than a language for the inner mind or the higher self to speak to all of its other aspects that feel as if they have been left behind. Prayer is not simply communication to God. It is not simply a begging of the mind to relieve the stresses or the pressures or the dilemmas or the sufferings of humanity. In fact, prayer is a very powerful way to commune with what is just beside you, unseen. It is a way to also draw to you all that you desire by sending forth, not simply a message, but a frequency. Prayer has a very specific frequency, a very specific vibration that transmutes almost everything. There are those that think of prayer as an SOS, save me, please. When things become truly uncomfortable, then they will turn to prayers. Well, it is much more than that. But why? Why do you believe that those who do not pray or do not believe in prayer, in just such moments of difficulty or turmoil, even they will turn to prayer? It is because in that moment the soul is able to remind the being or link with the being and the mind and say, here is the quickest way out of this or through this. Here, link this 
with that. Link the visible with the invisible. Communicate in the simplest, dearest and fastest language. The frequency, the vibration of prayer. It is a language that supersedes all other languages. It belongs not to religion at all. It belongs not to one God or others, even to one world or other worlds. Prayer is a language for those who seek to draw to themselves a solution, an understanding, an undertaking. Prayerful words, then, when enacted properly, which is to state them, in other words, not to be the beggar on the stool, it is, in essence, to draw to oneself what is most potently aware, what is most needed, what is most wanted, what will draw the quickest route in all ways and to all things. While you may direct your prayers to God or more than one God, to the angelic kingdom or to those whom you find both sane and heavenly, prayer is more than that again. It is the communion of that which is with that which is not. Therefore, it is the quickest way to unite all things separate. It is the quickest way to gather into the basket of life or into the heart's awareness all those things that have been omitted. It is the quickest way to open the gates, to open the prison, to unlock the cell. Prayer allows all things to order themselves or reorder themselves very quickly. A prayer, then, is not only a call to the holy. It is a call that says, undo. Do again. Out of chaos, make order. Out of all that that seems truthful but is not, restore truth. It is the way to impress upon God's essence or eminence all those things. It is to reset the clock or to reset the hand of God, if you will call it, or the word of God. Prayer restores intention. It restores integrity. It draws to itself its own. When a being places oneself into the prayerful mode, all is reset in the moment. Dignity is restored in the moment. And so personal prayer restores that which is the soul's deepest connection with the being, with the self. Now, of course, there are many different kinds of prayer, group prayers and collective prayers, but here we are concentrating upon the personal, upon the word, upon the self and the selfless. Certainly one can pray for another or pray for a certain outcome, or to be relieved from a certain outcome. This, too, restores. It restores the clock. It reverses time, in a sense. Or better put, it reverses the sequences that time had already set into motion. It does not undo that which has already been done upon the physical. However, it does undo or reveal a greater truth or undo that which has been hardened or that which exists between physical and non-physical. It removes certain boundaries. It unlimits. It removes barriers between knowing and not knowing. And so it undoes beliefs, if you like. Prayer allows belief to remain with the past moment or the past self. Prayer restores possibility. 
It restores the ability to trust, to see beyond, to discover. So there is a science, if you like, to prayer as well. It can be proven effective in all of the ways that I have described, which is not the same as to say it is only true if you can prove a certain outcome. If you are praying for a certain outcome upon the physical and that does not come about, that is not the same as understanding prayer or proving it correct or incorrect. That is simply a misuse or misunderstanding of the science of prayer. So prayer, there is a science, there is an art, and there is as well how to use it based upon ordinary beliefs or human history or how it is offered based upon certain religions. In this case, then, we offer it as a system a multi-layered system of communication where one can reveal to oneself a greater truth, setting it free from a lesser truth, where it can be revealed. Prayer reveals light. Prayer restores light to its original truth so it can become creative again. Prayer unlimits life. It makes life possible Again, life that is creative, not the same as the everyday experiential life. It would be appropriate also to visit meditation. When we speak of meditation, mostly Gaia will hear, Oh, but I cannot meditate. No, no, my mind is a busy one. My mind is an active one. No, I have not been trained in that. It is an Eastern philosophy, isn't it? Oh, I understand that you must have a mantra. No, I have no mantra of my own. Yes, I have tried with a candle. Yes, I have tried with the breath, but still to no avail. And on and on. So that meditation often becomes that which is dismissed, as an impossibility or relegated to those who have truly studied it or come from that certain tradition. But meditation in this context, in this powerful, practical context, is altogether different. To meditate is no more than to empty a room of its contents. Well, who hasn't done that, hmm? Who hasn't said, this room is too cluttered? Let's move a few of these items out of here and place them elsewhere. Or, I no longer have use of this. Let me find someone that would more honorably receive this gift or this token with my gratitude upon it as well. So meditation, then, in this context, is no more than to relieve oneself of certain items of clutter that are now taking up too much space. Where are they taking up too much space? Well, almost everywhere. So meditation, then, is simply an acknowledgement that there is something called the void, or the nothing, the nothingness, and that to that nothingness you can take those items that have overcluttered your thought, your rooms, your projects, your beliefs, your future references, or any other aspect of your life. To meditate, then, is no more than to unclutter or relieve yourself, or to create space. Yes, to create space. Space is something that can be created. Imagine that you have a room of a certain size. Well, it does not seem as if the room is going to get any bigger, so you cannot enlarge the room. You cannot push upon those walls to make them bigger. But perhaps... With just a little bit of working knowledge, you can then create space in that same room. 
That is what meditation does. It creates space in your life. Space is not room. It is not density. Space is nothingness. And it is very abundant in the universe. When you create space between you and your problem, sometimes it feels as if you are creating distance, but you are not. What you are creating is emptiness. You are creating empty space between here and there, between a problem and a solution, between a troubling thought and a wholesome thought. It is not the same as to create separation. Space is a very whole unit. When you enter the space of meditation, you enter a unit of wholeness, wholesomeness, where nothing exists. Well, if nothing exists there, then your clutter does not exist. Then your problem does not exist. No thing exists there. Space and more space and void space and deep space and aware space and more and more versions of space and dimensions of space. And it does not matter how much space you conceive of or create, you will not clutter your environment because units of wholeness do not create clutter. They are whole. They are complete. They are not partial. They are not particles. They are not searching for their other half or for anything else that is missing. Because they are already complete, they exist in perfect space, or if you like, in harmony or harmonic space. So meditation then is not simply a process by which you whisper or incant a certain mantra. It is no more than the space by which you remove the excess of life, excessive thoughts, excessive feelings that are redundant to your true nature, excessive thoughts, be they mindful or mindless. Space allows them to become whole, to become complete. In this state, sometimes they will dissolve Sometimes they will simply complete themselves and present themselves to you in a more complete form or formlessness. They, in essence, will inform you of what is taking place. There is no doing in meditation, for after all, what would you do with space? It is nothingness. It is void space. So, in fact, there is nothing that you can do, even if you are a doing person. In that moment, then, of meditation, it is a mediation, if you like, also between here and there and nowhere, in the no thing or the no place. So when or as you meditate, you allow simply the mind to work for you. And if you require to be in practical doing in order to allow this process to be useful to you, then imagine that while a part of you is very comfortably relaxing upon a cloud of nothingness, weightlessness, perfect harmony, whole units of nothingness, your mind is working in your favor, emptying out cobwebs and corners and clutter from anywhere in your life. You do not need to do anything other than that. You do not need to slow your thoughts nor empty them, though you may feel that that is taking place. If you require something else to do with your being, then allow, if possible, the process to slow, slow motion in one, while the aspect of the mind then removes, one by one or ten by ten, the clutters and complications of life. In wholeness, in nothingness, 
They do not exist. They have no meaning. In the wholeness of space, some thing has no context. In the nothing, in the no thing, it requires nothing. It requires no thing. Therefore, those complications or clutters of life cannot exist there well. All on their own, they will begin to dissolve. Therefore, do not be concerned whether you know how to meditate or what forms of study it has given to you or what techniques you have brought about. Certainly these will serve you and very well. However, you need only believe, if you like, in the nothing or in layered versions of nothing, and that will suit you well enough. It is well to consider, then, the subject of abundance as well. This is one thing we have touched upon here and there. What is abundance, then? What is naturally abundant? All things. Just as moments ago we have spoken of the no thing, then it would be appropriate as well to notice, bring forward, the all things. And that is what abundant nature is. Those things that are all ways possible. In order to have abundance does not mean that you must have a multitude or many of something. To be in abundance or have abundance is simply to know that there is an unlimited supply. Where is it? Well, somewhere. It is always somewhere or it is always available. To be abundant, do you always have to have that something or much of it gathered? No. Because I tell you that humanity for the most part believes in lack much more than it believes in abundance. If you will have ten of something, is that abundant? No. You would say it is just enough for now. Twenty would be better. Because ten will only last so long. Then I will have to replenish it. Ten is a good supply, you will say. If you had twenty, would you be abundant? Yes, it is abundant. But if I will need to lend some to someone else, then already I can see that I may not have enough for myself. So abundance, you see, is something that is very difficult for humanity to come by. It is not something that can be numbered. It is relative. Sometimes it seems present, but like all things, it is very elusive. So abundance, in truth, is that which is always present, always available. It is part of nature. It is part of the natural realm or the natural kingdoms. Abundance tells you that tomorrow there will be more or there will be less, but there will be. It is the field of possibilities. It is that which is always present, always creative, always able to be what it needs to be, to make and to remake itself. If there is an abundance of trees, will there always be trees? No, not necessarily. But there will always be the possibility that trees can exist and in fact today do exist. Is there an abundance of humanity upon the planet? Humanity is numbered, but an abundance of humanity comes when humanity believes that all things are possible, therefore humanity will always be possible, always able to regenerate itself, re-offer itself in a multitude of different ways. So is humanity abundant upon the earth? No, not necessarily. There are a great number of humans upon the earth, but humanity is not abundant in nature because for the most part it holds to lack more than to plenty. Once again, then, the theory and the science of abundance is to know that it is always possible, always near, always at the ready to make, to remake, to reinvent, to recreate, to bring itself forward in one form 
or another. It is the field of all possibilities to generate itself from the nothing to the something. So to be abundant in thought is to be creative and to be able to generate thoughts that create or bring forward quantity or quality or creativity. Abundance is not what is present, it is that which brings forward the desire again. With this understanding, it is a path. Abundance brings that which you want or need or desire. It is a path to something, not all that exists in the cupboard that is already present. Can your natural self be abundant? Yes. If you are naturally abundant, you will be much more prone, more able to bring forward those things that you want or desire, be it monies or those things that monies can bring. So does monies then come first and then you are abundant? Or does abundance come first and then you are able to generate monies? Perhaps you will see that it may be a little bit different than what you have imagined before. Remember, as I have said in the opening words, sometimes with these words, they lead. Sometimes they follow. It is not simply a matter of context. It is a matter of science. It is a matter of how they are invoked. It is a matter if you are working with some thing or no thing, the all thing or the void, the particleized space or the omnipotent all space, no space. So here you have an understanding, a pathway. Yes, we are describing, in essence, how to walk very stably upon the edge of a knife. Not because it is a sharp blade, but because it is so perfectly contoured that all things are possible. As we continue then, perhaps we will speak for a moment of grace. Grace is that which allows you to receive those things that you would not otherwise receive. Grace allows you to bypass anything, anything, in order to arrive at a place or a conclusion, an understanding or a benefit or a gift or what it will be. In essence, grace exists in a certain corridor outside of time. Grace allows you to open one door, go through it, and find yourself in a complete different dimension or a complete different thought. It is a way of going not from here to there, but from here to a perfect here, or from there to the next available there. It is a bypass, and in order to exist in grace, or work with grace, you must have assistance. So there are those who work with you either in and through the soul or in and through your own being. Grace stands apart from polarity. Grace is one of the few forces of nature, yes, it is indeed a force, that does not require negative or positive poles in order to be whole. It exists beyond it, or, better put, it contains already both poles. Similar to desire and intention, grace belongs to another dimension, and yet it is one that can be accessed from the third dimension or from those that have your understanding. Grace allows you simply to move beyond the logic of understanding or the realm of the mind or even the realm of emotion. It weaves these together if possible. It sets them aside altogether. In the same way that you cannot quite understand the dream state, what it is like or the symbolic nature 
grace is also less understood. It is ascribed at times to the realm of the angels because, for the most part, it is less understood. Well, it must be angelic then. It must be something that is bestowed upon you. Well, yes, it can be that way as well. But it is a soul's choice. And the soul understands how to move through space without needing to use polarity. Imagine if you could move through space or bilocate as you already know that you can without needing first to board a plane and to present a ticket or a passport in order to ride from here to there. That is what grace does. It undertakes all of this on your behalf. It arranges all of this for you by moving faster, if you like, by vibrating at a rate beyond that which you are ordinarily able to vibrate on your own. And so grace, when properly orchestrated then, moves your awareness quickly, very quickly, vibrationally, beyond here and there. Grace allows you to thread the eye of the needle or to have it done for you. It is that which lands you safely in the next version of yourself with a greater understanding or a deeper truth, or having already moved beyond a certain situation without even knowing how you arrived there. Now, does this mean that it was done for you? No, not entirely. However, it will feel that way to you. It will seem that way to you. Grace accelerates you to the highest version of you that is possible so that you move through space or through the eye of the needle in this case, finding yourself there or somewhere else entirely, seemingly without your awareness at all. But it is you, after all, that became aware of your new understanding or your new place from here to there, via nowhere. Not via a line or a vibration, not even a dimension that you could follow. Grace opens one door, moves through the next reality into the next door, and presents itself into nowhere and nothingness in a state of grace. Grace is a state. It is a vibrational state. You can call upon it, but you cannot do so with your logical mind. You can summon it, if you like. With your mindfulness, you can summon it. With your mind, you can only imagine it or imagine that it exists or imagine that it is possible. When you summon grace, you must also then be willing to accelerate yourself with or without your knowing. So grace is not to pardon yourself or excuse yourself from a certain understanding or to absent yourself from a certain lesson or undertaking. Instead, it is a vibrational acceleration of the very laws of nature that move in between here and there. It is a mindful state, and yes, for the most part, there are accelerated, advanced aspects of you living just beyond the present moment, just beyond the linear, logical self, and this acceleration then makes grace possible. Again, in this context, it is a scientific term, and you be begin to work with it from that reference. From here, we move on to the science of surrender. Well, that does not sound much like a science, does it? And yet I tell you that it is. To surrender something means to render it inert in this context. 
It does not mean to give it back. It does not mean to return it to the one that has sent it or given it. It simply means to render something inert, to return it to its original condition, to return it to its natural state. It is not the same as to give it back or have it taken it from you. When you surrender something, even if it is a thought, you allow it to be that which is, and in essence you begin to detach from it. Well, you may choose to say, well, Gaia, isn't that the same as just giving it back if you are becoming detached from it? After all, if something I do not wish to let go of is ripped from me, well, I may as well say I surrendered it. It sounds so much better to say it that way, doesn't it? Again, now we examine this from another perspective. To surrender a thought, an ambition, a desire, a fear, or even an object is simply to render its power inert. It allows it to return to its original state from where it can be made whole or made into something else. So to surrender something does not necessarily mean that you cannot have it or that you must give it back. In essence, you are returning it to its more potent, powerful, original state, so that if you do wish to have it, it will be restored in its own name, not in a lesser name, not as cause and effect from where it is already aging and decaying. So imagine that you surrender, for instance, a love, or a word, or a contract, well, all you are doing then in its truest sense is rendering it inert, giving it permission to become whole, potent, to restore itself, to render itself whole so that it can be of service to you or to others or to the earth or to nature in its highest and best use. Again, this applies to a thought or a thing equally. It can belong equally to matters of the heart or matters of the mind. It is the soul that orchestrates this after all. To surrender something is to yield it. It is to return it to itself. It is to remove ownership from it. It is not the same as to give it to someone else that will claim ownership. Again, that may very well be what is taking place upon the physical. Assume that you share a domesticated animal, a dog, with another, and yet the two owners can no longer be of one heart or one mind. One surrenders the animal, the pet, to the other. Is this surrender giving back, returning? On the physical plane, it may very well seem so. However, the energy or the truth of surrender restores not a binding contract between one and the other. It frees the moment. It makes the moment whole. See, humanity is seeking its freedom in this life. It seeks to understand the will or the will power or divine will, divine love. And somehow it understands that surrender is part of this. But in this case, again, to surrender is to free something from its own obligations, from an obligation to self or to any other being or thing. It renders inert anything that may have become, for instance, caustic, anything that has influence upon or over something. To surrender removes the power of something. So when you say, I surrender that, 
I surrender this. It does not mean that you must let go of it altogether. It means instead that you are, in essence, giving it to the field of pure potential so that it can become whole, so that if it is to be yours, it will then take on a higher form, a greater awareness. It will then become even more valuable. And of course, then it would be appropriate not to guard it so dearly that it becomes trapped yet again. Sometimes a thought or a thing must be surrendered many times until the process is complete. With each of the surrenders, it becomes more whole. It becomes more potent or more pure in terms of potential. It becomes more free. It does not always take place in the moment or on the first instance, for surrender is something that humanity is still understanding. Humanity wars with itself, and to surrender something is to give up. To surrender is to lose something or lose hold over something. Once you understand how to use surrender practically, not as a tool, but as an understanding and an undertaking, you will see just how much of your life you can restore, whether it is a cell within your body, a thought within your mind, a thing that is precious to you, or even something greater than that. And while we are on the topic of surrender, in similar fashion, perhaps it would be appropriate to differentiate a bit between giving and offering. After all, what is the difference to give something or to offer something? How simple the difference between the two words. Hmm? Well, from humanity's sake, most of the time that it gives something, it assumes that what it is giving is needed by the other that is receiving. If you are giving, someone is receiving. If you are giving water to a plant, it is receiving that water. Can you offer water to a plant without giving water to the plant? Yes. To offer it places it within the field. When you offer something, it places it near someone or something. It does not assume that it is needed. It does not assume that the thing or the thought or the word is needed. When you offer advice, is it the same as giving advice? No. When you offer advice, you place it near enough to someone or something that it may become interesting or useful. To offer is non-invasive, in other words. To give even if the giving is a very sweet thing, even if it is very necessary, it is of an invasive nature. It is always more appropriate than to offer, than to give. If you offer, does that mean that you cannot give? No. Sometimes the offering is so automatically received with glee, with gusto, that quickly it is also then given over. When you give, it makes something very physical. To give brings it into the manifest world. To offer allows it to remain in the subtle realms. To offer something allows choice. To give has already bypassed that choice and placed it in the polarity of giving and receiving, or reciprocating, or like that. Sometimes you may wonder, but I gave and gave, and how little thankful they were. Why were they not in gratitude? Why did they not give thanks for all that I have done for them? Look at all that I have given. Well, it is so. Much was given. It was placed into the field of another.
Imagine that. Imagine that you go around the homes of others, opening the doors and depositing those things that you believe they most need, that is most necessary. They need this. I'll give it to them. Energetically, that is what it is to give. To offer, on the other hand, leaves it at the doorstep and, as a matter of fact, barely there, lightly there, for on the doorstep even, it does not even exist in the physical realm. It is more of the slightest taste or nuance or scent of something to come. It is a fragrance of life, an offering of life itself. Does this mean that you cannot give to another what you know that they expect or what you know that they would love to receive? No. Giving and receiving is quite natural. It is very human as a matter of fact. But an offering, that is something that is beyond human. An offering. An offering is something that you present ever so lightly with absolutely no expectation that someone or something needs it or wants it. You place it there lightly. Perfume. If the fragrance is carried just so, and it is received, so much the better. What if you offer something and no one or no thing wants it or wants to receive it. Does that mean that what you have offered is less than valuable or less than needed? No, for an offering does not come even close to that polarity. Perhaps you will notice that most of the words that we have been speaking of here are absent something. They are absent polarity for the most part. You will notice that they have much less of a positive or negative charge than other words. This is exactly what makes them potent, what makes them powerful, and what makes them practical.